Here's the plan for class tonight. Uh, two chapters of covering in the text and uh, at least hopefully a few minutes talking about an overview of the book. Um, we've got 26 lessons this summer, 28 chapters. So Michael, Robert, and I, uh, th- this isn't going to be a class where we can really sit down and smell the roses too much. Uh, we're going to have to keep the pace going. So without further ado, let's uh, jump in and um, we'll see how this goes. I want to go ahead and just read the first two chapters in their entirety. Maybe we'll read sections of it uh, later on when we're talking about them, but let's just begin by reading and getting the text in front of us. So Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, we'll begin there. Read all the way through Matthew chapter 1 and chapter 2 and end uh, at the end of chapter 2. Here we go. The Gospel according to Matthew chapter 1. The record of the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers. Judah was the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar. Perez was the father of Hezron, and Hezron the father of Ram. Ram was the father of Amminadab, Amminadab the father of Nashon, and Nashon the father of Salmon. Salmon was the father of Boaz by Rahab. Boaz was the father of Obed by Ruth. And Obed was the father of Jesse. Jesse was the father of David the king. David was the father of Solomon by Bathsheba, who had been the wife of Uriah. Solomon was the father of Rehoboam. Rehoboam, the father of Abijah. And Abijah, the father of Asa. Asa was the father of Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat, the father of Joram. And Joram, the father of Uzziah. Uzziah was the father of Jotham. Jotham, the father of Ahaz. And Ahaz, the father of Hezekiah. Hezekiah was the father of Manasseh, Manasseh the father of Ammon, and Ammon the father of Josiah. Josiah became the father of Jeconiah and his brothers at the time of the deportation to Babylon. After the deportation to Babylon, Jeconiah became the father of Shealtiel, and Shealtiel the father of Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel was the father of Abihud, Abihud the father of Eliakim, and Eliakim the father of Azor. Azor was the father of Zadok, Zadok the father of Achim, Achim, the father of Eliud. Eliud was the father of Eliezer. Eliezer, the father of Meton. Meton, the father of Jacob. Jacob was the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, by whom Jesus was born, who was called the Messiah. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. From David to the deportation of Babylon to Babylon, 14 generations. And from the deportation to Babylon to the Messiah, 14 generations. Chapter 1, verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, planned to send her away secretly. But when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. For the child who had been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Quote, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated means God with us. And Joseph awoke from his sleep and did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took Mary his wife but kept her aversion until she gave birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. Matthew chapter 2. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. Gathering together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for this is what has been written by the prophet, quote, And you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are by no means least among the leaders of Judah, for out of you shall come forth a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called the Magi and determined from them the exact time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child, and when you have found him, report to me, so that I too may come and worship him. 
After hearing the king, they went their way, and the star, which had been seen in the east, went on before them until it came and stood over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. After coming into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother. They fell to the ground and worshipped him. Then, opening their treasures, they presented to him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned by God in a dream not to return to Herod, the Magi left for their own country by another way. Chapter 2, verse 13. Now when they had gone, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to destroy him. So Joseph got up and took the child and his mother, while it was still night, and left for Egypt. He remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet, quote, out of Egypt I called my son. Then when Herod saw that he had been tricked by the Magi, he became very enraged and sent and slew all the male children who were in Bethlehem and all its vicinity from two years old and under, according to the time which he had determined from the Magi. Then what was spoken by, through the prophet, then what had been spoken through Jeremiah, the prophet was fulfilled, quote, a voice was heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted because they were no more. But when Herod died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go into the land of Israel. For those who sought the life of your child are dead. So Joseph got up, took the child and his mother, and came into the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Then after being warned by God in a dream, he left for the regions of Galilee and came and lived in a city called Nazareth. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophets, quote, he shall be called a Nazarene. Okay, um, let's jump in. Like I said, tonight especially, not, lot, lots of material and not uh, a whole lot of time. So let's talk about the genealogy. In your questions I asked you, I think I asked you, I don't actually have them in front of me, about the genealogies. I mean, maybe you can just shout out quickly. What kind of valuable tidbits do we feel like come out of the genealogies, or what might we say about the overall purpose of a genealogy? Shout it out. Proof that Jesus is the Christ. What else would you say about genealogies? Waste of time? Well, we at least would know that much. So let's just talk about, really, the, if you notice in verse 1, the two things that are highlighted are the fact that Jesus is the son of David and that he is the son of Abraham. Okay? Um, and that actually, by the way, helps us to see that son of doesn't necessarily mean you know, direct father to son. It can skip over generations, and so uh, not every single descendant is listed in Matthew's account here, uh, but he is the son of David, he's the son of Abraham. The son of David, I think we would recognize, pointing to his role as the Messiah, the king, the anticipated anointed one that was going to come. Just reading this, I mean, not only is he called the Messiah in verse 1 and called the son of David, you notice in verse 6 that David serves as a center point. He's one of the markers of the genealogy as we get to David the king and then turn the corner from David onward. And notice in verse uh, 17 that, uh, again, it says that from Abraham to David are 14 generations, David to Babylon is 14 generations. And there are numerous theories, no pun intended, uh, there are theories about why Matthew points out the 14 generations here, 14 generations here, 14 generations here. Some say it has to do with the composite of that, which is 42, and there's some significance to that. I'll give you this one as a suggestion. In Hebrew, each letter not only represents a letter, but it represents a number, okay? And so each letter has a numeric value. And the total number of a person's name had some significance, okay? Uh, this is hard for us to relate to, uh, and it could be this is totally just speculation. But uh, this is one of the theories that's accepted. David's name, there's no vowels, it's just consonants. D, V, really more like a W, but D, V, and D would add up to 14. 14 being the Davidic number. So it could be that Matthew is making a uh, special point here to focus the attention on David and on Jesus as the son of David and the Messiah. Okay, take that or leave that. You'll probably leave it. That's fine. The son of Abraham is the other thing that's said in verse 1 of chapter 1. 
And think about uh, what that would mean for an audience that was uh, so familiar and relied so heavily on the promises that were made to Abraham. Remember, Abraham was told, uh, through your seed, all the families of the earth will be blessed. There is a universal promise to Abraham. That's one of the things that sets Abraham apart as this patriarch, is that through his family, there will be a blessing to the entire world. And remember, Paul will pick up on that later to say that this is a you know, foreshadowing of Gentiles coming into the kingdom. In the Gospels, it's not as, as explicitly spelled out as Paul will do later on, but there are these hints along the way, and the genealogy of Matthew, I think, is one of those. Um, there are four women mentioned in just four verses here at the beginning. We have uh, Tamar, who is the father of Perez and Zerah. By the way, if you remember that story, that's an awful story. Uh, Tamar is Judah's daughter-in-law, and uh, because she has felt like she's been unjustly treated by Judah, she disguises herself as a prostitute and sleeps with her own father-in-law, Judah, that's right, the Judah, you know, the son of Jacob, um, and conceives and bears these twins. The younger of the two, it turns out, is the one that carries on the line. Um, Rahab is mentioned, not an Israelite, also a prostitute. Uh, but as we know, in Judges comes into the nation of Israel, Ruth, also not an Israelite. Uh, we know that story as well. And then Bathsheba, or literally the text doesn't even say her name. It just says she of Uriah, as mentioned as well in verse 6. So um, not common for women to be mentioned in genealogies. And you would imagine that in Jewish circles, not common for Gentiles to be mentioned in genealogies. Um, but both of those are, are, are presented here. Um, this is not a whitewashed list of Jesus' lineage. This is the picture of what God was doing from the time of Abraham forward, even through, uh, through wicked people, through Gentiles, through unexpected people, to bring about his plan of the Messiah. Let's keep going here and uh, move on to the birth that we read about in 18 to 25. Um, Joseph, you notice that in uh, Matthew's account, in chapter 1 and in chapter 2, notice that Joseph is the focus of the narrative, okay? Um, and uh, uh, just to contrast, the Gospel of Luke does the opposite. It focuses on Mary's perspective and talks about her, but Matthew focuses on Joseph. And I don't know exactly why that is, but it is interesting some of the things that come out of that, as we'll see uh, in this chapter and the next. So Joseph has a dream. That probably uh, sounds familiar to us. And the dream tells him not to put away Mary. Um, he would have reason to do so. A betrothal in these days, like an engagement, but way more serious. Okay? Uh, betrothal could only have been broken by death or divorce. So it was essentially the same as marriage. And so when Joseph finds out Mary is with child, you can imagine, as uh, would be natural what he uh, suspects, but the angel in the dream tells him uh, that this child is uh, literally begotten in her of the Holy Spirit. Okay? So think about that in contrast to what we just saw. Matthew just started with this genealogy to say that uh, Jesus' lineage is this person begat this person, begat this person. Therefore, he's the son of David. He's the son of Abraham. But then the angel in the dream says he's begotten of the Holy Spirit. And so already in Matthew, we're seeing this compliment, uh, compliment of, you know, Jesus is the son of man. He is the son of David. He is the son of God. Uh, and he is, as the text says, God with us. Um, his name, Jesus, is uh, the same as the, as the very common Hebrew name Joshua or Jeshua, which means, Jesus, uh, which means Jehovah saves. And the angel uh, says that that's an intentional naming because he will save people from their sins. And then Matthew says that this was written to fulfill what was written. Uh, I didn't count, but I think there's four or five times just in the first two chapters that we read that Matthew says that this was to fulfill what was written. That's big for Matthew. We'll be focusing on that in our class this summer, especially at the beginning of the gospel and at the end of the gospel. Matthew's going to say over and over again, this is to fulfill what was written. In this case in particular, this is a quote from Isaiah 7. I'd ask you to read that passage. Um, uh, in, the, uh, in the questions ahead of time. And it's an interesting story about Ahaz asking for a sign, or sorry, God telling Ahaz to ask for a sign. Ahaz says he won't ask for a sign. And God says, I'll give you one anyway. The sign will be a virgin bearing a child. Um, likely that was fulfilled in Ahaz's time. 
but Matthew says that this was looking forward to a, a real virgin conception of, uh, of one that would be called God with us. And Jesus, the Son of God, begotten of the Holy Spirit, is exactly that. He is God with us. Okay, I'm going to breathe here for a second. And uh, anything from you, questions, comments, contributions, just on Matthew chapter 1 here before we move on to Matthew chapter 2. Yeah, Steve. consumed with endless genealogy uh, got to be reason why he said that I was just curious what your thought was uh, yeah that's a good question there's somewhere in between there's somewhere where okay Luke and Matthew both included genealogy so the Holy Spirit has determined that it's helpful for there to be two genealogies of our Lord included in the Gospels and yet Paul has this warning about you know uh, don't get caught up in endless genealogies now, the other question would be, is Paul talking about the genealogies of Jesus, or is he talking about the genealogies that they would have been presenting? It's likely that they were wanting to prove their own authority by saying, hey, look at my genealogy goes all the way back to, you know, whoever. So uh, that's probably uh, what, what's going on there. Uh, and so we avoid the danger, but we do want to appreciate to some degree the value of the genealogies that he has. Yeah, Brian. The Jews who reject the Messiah, the Jews who reject the Messiah, go to these genealogies to prove that he is not the Messiah. And I can, and without getting into the gory details and beyond the scope of this class, I think the genealogy given to Mary overcomes the arguments and the objections to what the Jews raise concerning Joseph, and vice versa, by the way. And then the other point I'd just simply make is what's neat about these genealogies is what they don't, who they exclude. And if you'll notice, the first king of Israel, uh, Saul of, of uh, the tribe of Benjamin, is excluded because he was rejected by God because of his sins. And logically, at the granular level, that king, of, out of all the kings, is excluded. I was, it's, the genealogies, this one especially, uh, just to, clear, uh, to, to kind of... Second, something that, that Brian said, most people think that if you take the Bible seriously, which we do, and see it as being infallible, that the, the reason that Luke's genealogy and Matthew's genealogy is different is because Luke is tracking Mary's line and Matthew is tracking Joseph's line, okay? And so they're not exactly the same. Joseph's line is the one that runs through all these kings. And so there's something cool about Matthew's genealogy in that, uh, to Brian's point, as you're reading it, you're kind of like re replaying in quick motion the whole history of the Old Testament. So you're remembering all these people and the stories behind them and the names have significance. And, you know, you're thinking about, oh, you know, yeah, I went to David because not, not Saul and all that kind of stuff. And, and it just reminds you of God's plan through all of this to perfectly, uh, you know, uh, pull the string, so to speak, uh, guide all the events to the coming of Jesus in the fullness of time, as Paul says. Okay. Michael, last word on chapter one. Um, <laughs> the, when uh, I guess the, the emphasis on you know David, I'm also reminded of God's promise that um, David's uh, seed would rule Israel forever. You know, like you know Jesus is the fulfillment of that, um, and so I I think perhaps part of what Matthew's already getting at is he's getting us to think about, and I mean, he mentioned previous kings, you know, but getting us to think about kingship, you know, which is something that we'll probably be seeing a whole lot throughout the book. You know, there's a woven into the book, an emphasis of, of Jesus kingship. Yeah, and that's a good segue into chapter two. I'll just say, uh, Michael's right. Um, and he's obviously going to be one of our teachers, so he'll be uh, emphasizing this as well. Kingship and kingdom and Jesus is a king and all that is, is huge in Matthew. I don't know if you're a Bible scribbler, you know, underliner or whatever. If you are, here's a tip. You know, uh, some people have different systems. So if you want to find someone's system, I could point you in a direction. But uh, little symbols that you can use and repeat them throughout your, your Bible so that they have a common you know, significance or meaning. So if, if, if you can do it, like, unlike me, which is, you know, takes too long and doesn't look like anything, a little crown, if you learn how to draw a little crown real quickly, and all throughout Matthew in the margins, you know, draw a little crown every time there's any kind of reference to king or kingdom or kingship or Jesus' authority as king, anything like that, 
that's a nice little tip to be able to then you look back and say, man, you know, Michael was right. You know, kingship is all over Matthew, and just marking something like that is, is helpful, um, you know, for, uh, for seeing that in an easy way. But that's actually segues nicely into the Magi, the three wise men, you know, from the Oriental. We three kings of Orient. You know, they're, not from the, they're not from the Orient, okay? They're from, probably from Babylon, okay? Uh, they, it wasn't three of them, you know, and they weren't kings. So that whole song is just, you know, debunked right there before your eyes. Sorry if you, that's your favorite song uh, there. But Matthew 2 introduces, along with the idea of Jesus as king, um, kind of a corollary theme that Matthew is going to uh, develop throughout his gospel which is the difference between the way the Gentiles received Jesus, the Messiah. I mean, think about it. Chapter 1 laid out Jesus is the Messiah. He's the son of David. He's the son of Abraham. He has this rich lineage of all the kings of Judah. And yet, what's going to be the theme throughout is that the Jews, his own people, will not accept him. And the Genti- there will be Gentiles along the way that will. And this is a uh, perfect example of that. Here you have wise men. These are probably, you know, priests of some pagan eastern religion again likely from babylon would be my guess and uh they come they show up and say hey we heard the king of the jews was born you know and everyone around's like wait what you know they knew somehow how did they know were they was it revealed to them by god um did they know some other way they show up saying we know the king of the jews has been born where is he and you'll notice the reactions of those who are local those who are jewish uh, the priests and the scribes know the, pr- uh, the prophecy. They know the scripture, right? You could probably, you know, in your own mind, think about some of the things that Jesus would say to these same sorts of people. They knew the scripture, Micah 5, you could go read that. Uh, we won't dwell on that uh, in this class. But um, Micah 5 talked about Bethlehem and a ruler coming out of Bethlehem. When they were asked by Herod, where's the Messiah going to be born? They knew, they knew that answer. And yet, they weren't, you know, it was the wise men that knew that the king of the Jews had been born. And then interesting, we don't want to speculate too much. Notice that when, when the city hears that the Messiah or the king of the Jews has been born, it's not like there's a rush to go see him. You know, they're not all, oh, well, we, you know, that's great news. You know, we want to go see him as well. Now, there are different explanations you could give for that. Uh, Herod was clearly upset by this report. And so you could imagine Jewish authorities wanting to lay low a little bit and not uh, right in front of Herod, who's, you know, getting already pretty upset about this king of the Jews, say, oh, I want to go see him too, you know. Um, so maybe that was it. But, but still, there's not the same reaction among the Jews uh, as at least among these Eastern Gentiles. Herod, of course, not really a Jew, uh, but his family line is kind of mixed between Edomite and Jewish. And so he's friendly with the Jews. He's built their temple. So they respect him to some degree because of that, but he's just a pawn, a governor for the Roman government. Um, but he is threatened by the birth of this one that's called the king of the Jews. And yet uh, it is this, uh, these Gentiles, these magi from the east that go and they worship. So think about what Michael has just said and think about how Matthew is all the long, especially here at the beginning of his gospel, painting the picture. What would happen when a king would be born? The crown prince of, a, of, a, of royalty, the first son of a king is born. What's the reaction in a kingdom? Everyone comes from miles around. This is like Lion King, right? They all come to Pride Rock and they bring their gifts and they, uh, they, they, the, the best that they could afford. They saved up, you know, ever since they heard that the king was going to have a son. And they bring their gifts and, and lords and, and royalty from other countries come and bring gifts to the king that's been born. Um, that's what's happening here in Matthew chapter 2, is that at least there are some that recognize that the king of the Jews has been born, and they bring him their gifts, frankincense, gold, and myrrh, and they worship him, uh, the child, and uh, they are um, warned by God, as James Taylor sung about in his song, to go uh, home by another way. Um, And that's the story of the Magi. Again, uh, among many other things we could say about that story, shows, I think, the difference in reaction among Jews and Gentiles, okay? Um, let's keep going here, and then there'll be time, maybe I, we can have enough time for uh, some, some questions or comments uh, at the end of chapter 2 as well. Chapter 2, verse 13 and following, um, again, we're back to something that should sound familiar. In fact, a couple things that should sound familiar. Does, it, does this ring any bells for you? A man named Joseph has a dream. 
And because of that dream, his family uh, escapes to Egypt and through that saves their life. Does that sound familiar to anybody? That's the story in Matthew 2. Sounds like a story that we've already been told in the book of Genesis. Okay. Uh, what about this? Does this sound familiar? A king kills babies in order to prevent uh, the uprising of an oppressed people. Does that sound familiar? Yeah, that sounds like this, the beginning of the story of Moses in Exodus chapters 1 and 2. Okay. So what is Matthew doing here? Okay. He's telling the story of Jesus as an infant. And Joseph, seeing in a dream a warning to escape, seeing Herod uh, in Judea killing these babies, and uh, Joseph, Mary, and Jesus escaping that, similar to the way Moses did. What's going on here? Well, all of this, I think, gets to this point that we want to talk about for a few minutes here. I'll remind you of the phrase that Matthew has already used a bunch of times here in chapters 1 and 2, and he mentions it again in verse 15, after saying that they took the child Uh, to Egypt, verse 15 says, he remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet, quote, out of Egypt, I called my son. This was also on your worksheet, so hopefully you got a chance to look at this ahead of time. You're using your cross-reference. You uh, uh, will note that um, this comes from Hosea 11, verse 1, right? Um, Again, with Bible study tips, Always go back and read these passages. Don't just note it and say, oh, this is a quote from the Old Testament. Go back and read these passages in their context, see what's going on, and see how that might inform what's uh, being quoted in the New Testament. But this one is, uh, is, is interesting. I think that's what I have. Up. Out of Egypt I called my son. So you read this in Matthew and you think, oh, well, this is cool. Apparently, you're saying to yourself as you're studying your Bible, apparently Hosea predicted that when the Messiah was born, that he would, uh, would, would, you know, come out of Egypt, right? That's cool that Hosea predicted the Messiah would, you know, come up out of Egypt, right? So you're going to go, I want to go read that, because that sounds like an amazing prediction that would have been made by the prophets, okay? So you go back, and this is what you read in Hosea 11, 1 to 4. When Israel was a youth, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son, And the more they called them, the more they went from them. They kept sacrificing to the Baals and burning incense to idols. Yet it is I who taught Ephraim to walk. I took them in my arms, but they did not know that I healed them. I led them with cords of a man, with bonds of love. And I became to them as one who lifts the yoke from their jaws. And I bent down and fed them. And the text goes on to say, uh, actually, uh, ironically, the very next line is, Will they go to Egypt? (laughs) And the point is, they're not going to Egypt for slavery this time. They're going to Assyria. And it's about the judgment that God's going to bring upon them. Well, so now I'm confused. Because I thought Matthew said that this was a fulfillment of a prophecy that Hosea made. That the Son of God would come up out of Egypt. And I go back and read and I say, wait a second. This isn't about, this, this isn't about the Messiah. Who is this passage about? When Hosea says, out of Egypt I called my son, who is he talking about? Remember our, our, our uh, classes on Hebrew parallelism, right? So the first two lines go together, right? So uh, who is the son that was called out of Egypt? Israel. When Israel was a youth, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son, right? And what's this passage about? This passage is about God uh, viewing Israel as his son, delivering him out of Egypt, and what? What's, what, what's this passage about? They did not follow him. They turned away from him. Okay. So somehow, Matthew says that Hosea 11 is, uh, is fulfilled in Jesus as a baby coming up out of Egypt. When it looks like Hosea 11 is, is just simply about uh, Israel being God's son and then rejecting him and turning away from him. Okay. Well... Uh, this is what we would say about this, is that, that this is just one example, okay, and we could make many throughout, uh, throughout the book of Matthew and, and other places, that, that the fulfillment, when we talk about the fulfillment of the Old Testament and the New Testament, or the prophets, or the law being fulfilled in Christ, or in the New Testament, okay, um, 
Oftentimes what we think is like what I was kind of, you know, making up earlier. We think that it's just a list of predictions, that the prophets had all these predictions about what was going to happen. The Messiah is going to be born in Bethlehem, and I predict the Messiah will be born of a virgin. I predict that the Messiah will suffer and all this stuff. There are some passages that read much like that, okay, that there is a vision of the future and what the Messiah will be, okay. But the fulfillment of the scriptures is much deeper than that. And it's much more complex than that, okay? In fact, we'll get to a point in uh, Matthew chapter 5 in the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus famously says, I did not come to abolish the law and the prophets, but to do what? To fulfill it. How does Jesus fulfill the law and the prophets? Well, that's a deep question. And it's not just that Jesus came and checked off the list of predictions that the prophets made about what the Messiah would do. The idea of fulfillment is that Jesus comes and in his person... He fulfills, he embodies everything that the Old Testament was looking forward to. In this case in particular, in Hosea, this is what we would say. Hosea 11.1 is a passage about the failure of Israel, God's son. Who is Jesus? When he comes on the scene, he is uh, God's true son. He is, we might say, everything that Israel failed to be. Israel failed to live up to the calling as God's son. Jesus comes and he, he fulfills that. He is the son uh, that God uh, you know, wanted in Israel and didn't have. Okay? By the way, uh, don't, don't read into that that we're saying that there was like a mistake that, that God had been audible and say, oh, well, Israel didn't work out, so I'll, I'll send my son. Okay? But you will remember the, the language in Hebrews that, that I think John Moon pointed us to recently around the Lord's table about the covenant that they broke so now there's a new covenant, right? So there's a fulfillment in Jesus of the things that Israel failed to be. Um, and so a passage like this, Hosea 11, is a little bit of confusing quotation, but actually helps us to understand a little bit about what the New Testament authors are doing when they say that Jesus fulfills the, uh, the prophecies or the prophets uh, or the stories of the Old Testament, okay? There's a couple other ones in here. Uh, I love this one, and uh, we talked about it some in our Jeremiah class, but we just don't have time to talk more about it. Rachel weeping for her children is the, uh, is the picture. That actually comes out of Jeremiah 31. If you remember Jeremiah last year, this is the middle of the book of comfort. This is actually this, the, the, the section of Jeremiah where there's a promise. Of, it's the same chapter, literally, as the, as the new covenant. And yet, in that section, Jeremiah kind of takes an aside to talk about the weeping of Rachel, that God's people are suffering, they are dying, and Rachel is weeping figuratively about that. And yet, out of those tears will come redemption. And so, uh, maybe there's some of that going on here in Matthew 2, that uh, this, is a, this is a horrible thing. How many mothers are weeping over their child that's been killed by Herod because Herod wants to you know, uh, stamp out? what he thinks is this, uh, you know, king of the Jews that's been born. And yet, in all these tears and all these mourning of children, those uh, mothers that never got over uh, the death of their child killed by Herod, yet in the middle of that, God is working his plan of redemption to, uh, to bring Jesus out of that and to, uh, to save his people. And then this one, uh, then, then we'll um, be done with one and two. We'll take some comments, questions, and then uh, overview the book before we quit. This is another interesting one, because the end, very end here. So uh, they go to Egypt, they come out of Egypt, as we said. Uh, there are two more dreams before the chapter is over, in which, uh, you know, Joseph sees not to go back to, uh, to Judea, but actually to go back to Galilee, and so he goes to Nazareth. And in uh, 23, it says that this was to fulfill what was spoken to the prophets, he shall be called a Nazarene. So, in another confusing moment of Bible study, you're looking at your, your uh, you know, text in, the, in uh, Matthew 2, 23. You think, oh, footnote, where is that quoted? And you're looking and looking, and you're, well, there's no footnote. Well, it's a quotation. It says this is to fulfill. There's no quotation. And in fact, there's nowhere in the Old Testament that says this. There's nowhere that says he shall be called a Nazarene. Okay? So, man, Matt, you know, it's funny. Matthew's a tax collector, and he's this Hebrew, and it's like, he doesn't know his Bible at all, you know? And he's very imprecise about his quotations, you know? You would expect Matthew to be very meticulous, and so we think, oh, Matthew's a slacker, and he doesn't know his Bible, and is uh, sloppy with his quotations, you know? What's going on here? Um, 
Again, there are other interpretations of what Matthew is doing here, but I'll give you this one, which I think is, uh, is best here. Um, the word Nazarene, okay, is connect that, that obviously, in Matthew's storytelling, means that Jesus is from Nazareth, okay? But the, the Hebrew word Nazar, okay, is a word that means branch, okay? So by the way, there's a nice English joke here, because you can say Matthew says that, that Jesus literally is from the sticks, you know, he's from, he's from Nazareth in Galilee. He's from, literally, Nazarene, uh, stick town, you know, okay? Um, but Nazar is a word that means branch. And once you know that, once you know that Nazar, okay, which is the root of Nazarene, means branch, then if you know some of the Old Testament prophecies, that registers. Because you realize, oh, branch is a significant term in the prophetic language. And Isaiah 11 talks about a branch from the house of Jesse that will come and be this, uh, you know, this Messiah. Zechariah 3, the Messiah is predicted as branch that will come and, uh, and you know, purify God's people forever, okay? Um, so, wh- where, where does it say that, that uh, you know, he will be called a Nazarene? Well, it doesn't necessarily, except for there are several prophets that talk about the Messiah being called the branch, um, and so what we have here then is another sort of play on words where Jesus is from Nazareth. So he is a Nazarene, but he is also the Nazar, the branch uh, that has been predicted by the prophets to come and, uh, and, and redeem God's people. Okay. Um, so what does, uh, what does Matthew mean when he says that this is to fulfill what was written? Well, y- you can't just, you know, it's, it's not, not, a simple, not a simple exercise and there's a lot of depth to how Matthew uses his Old Testament. Okay, quickly, comments or questions on uh, just on chapter 2. The Magi, Herod, the flight to Egypt, the return to Nazareth, anything on any of that? Okay, I have uh, nine minutes by my count here. Um, So let's give a quick overview of the book. Um, I didn't know exactly when to do this. You know, Michael's got to get through two more chapters on Sunday. So we don't have a ton of time to just stop and say, here's, you know, here's a volcano. Let's look at a volcano for, you know, hours on end, you know, before we actually study the text. Not this time. So, uh, so let's talk about the, the, uh, the book of Matthew as a whole with the time that we have left. Hopefully we'll be able to refer back to this. And uh, maybe this will even be on a quiz at some point. Well, the book of Matthew gives us some clues about how Matthew is telling his story and, and the, uh, the structure of, uh, of this gospel. Five times in the book of Matthew, Matthew gives almost the exact same phrase. It goes something like this. When Jesus had finished, and then three times it's had finished these words. A couple other times it's something similar. It's these instructions or these parables. And the notice in the last one is kind of a, it's a all of it. It's, you know, when Jesus had finished all these words. So five times, Matthew stops to say, when Jesus had finished saying these things, right? And what that marks for us is that there are five uh, sermons in the book of Matthew, okay? Uh, or maybe we say five, the fancy word is discourses. We'll just say teaching, right? So I'll give you the one that we all know about. Chapter 7, verse 28 said, when Jesus had finished these words. What did Jesus just finish in Matthew 7? The Sermon on the Mount. Right? That's the first uh, you know, um, block of teaching that we find in Matthew. Well, before Matthew gives us that big block of Jesus' teaching, there is a narrative, there is a story okay, that is leading up to Jesus going up onto the mountain and giving this teaching. And that's how the rest of this will work. So when Jesus finishes the Sermon on the Mount, There's going to be two more chapters of story, of narrative, where Jesus is going around doing miracles and some other things, okay? And that will lead us into chapter 10, which is another big block of teaching. By the way, uh, I have mixed thoughts about the words of Christ in red, okay? But in Matthew, it can be helpful for looking through and seeing where these big sections of red text are, where Jesus is, uh, is teaching. So chapter 10, there's a teaching about giving instructions to his disciples that will go out and do the work that he's been doing. Well, then in chapter 11, we pick up with a couple chapters of narrative, of stories about Jesus and the various reactions to Jesus, his family, and John the Baptist, and the Pharisees, and people are, are, are uh, you know, reacting in different ways. Well, that leads in then to another big section of teaching in uh, the parables in chapter 13, uh, which takes up most of that chapter. That's just the first bell, right, Mike? Okay. Um, okay, well, then after that, you, you, you get how this is going here, all right? 
And we'll come back to this, uh, but this is basically the structure of the book of Matthew. Now, one of the things, and this is for Robert and Michael and I to work on as we go, hopefully by the end of the summer, this won't just say narrative teaching number one, narrative teaching number two. What we'll do as we go through is is talk about the themes and the focus of each of these uh, sermons and each of these narratives, okay? So then we'll be able to say, oh yeah, five to seven is the Sermon on the Mount, and you know, uh, 10 is the, I don't know what we're going to call it, the limited commission or something like that. You know, 13 is the parables. Uh, and maybe even uh, come up with some fancy terms or, or descriptions for the narrative, you know, the miracles or, you know, the reactions or whatever it is. Um, and we'll be able to see how all this fits together. But Matthew is putting together here sections of story and then a section of teaching. Se- a, a section of stories, section of teaching all the way through. And you'll notice that we actually haven't got quite to the end of the book. Uh, Because after 26 verse 1, Jesus had finished all these words, that's the closing events of Jesus' life. Uh, The arrest, the trial, the crucifixion, the resurrection, which you can understand serves as a grand conclusion to Matthew's gospel. Okay, Um, So, like I said, I just want to introduce that and we'll come back to it. Two things to focus on in, uh, in Matthew. Robert and Michael and I have actually not talked about this. So if they want to vote me down and, and uh, you know, uh, p- put in some other things here. But here's, I think, what we'll be focusing on as we go through Matthew. As we've already talked about, as you read, and please be reading in Matthew uh, ahead of time. We want to focus on, because this is what Matthew's doing. He is focusing on Jesus as the continuation and the fulfillment of Israel's story. Okay. Uh, so we saw some examples of that tonight. We'll continue to look at it. Maybe two way, two specific ways to, to look at this, and there'd be a host of others. Okay, we talked about the kingdom already. So look to how Jesus is being presented as the Messiah, which means the King. He's the Son of David, uh, and the kingdom of heaven is a huge theme for Matthew in his gospel. But also look at how Jesus represents the new Moses. Okay, um, by the way. May, may, did anybody think this? You're like, oh, it's interesting that in Matthew's gospel, there are five books of teaching that are, you know, laid out throughout his gospel. Maybe that's intentional. That he's recreating, right, the five books of Moses. These are the five teachings of Jesus. Uh, and it's a way to present Jesus as a new Moses with a new law. He's going to go up on a mountain. He's going to present it, uh, so on and so forth. So, uh, whether it's him following uh, the fulfillment of David or being the fulfillment of Moses or being the fulfillment of, uh, of you know, Abraham, whoever else, Matthew is presenting Jesus as the continuation, the fulfillment of Israel's story. And uh, to do that, he is, as we've already said, weaving together uh, stories and teachings in a purposeful way. Um, I already mentioned, I mentioned a couple of times that we are a little bit short on time this summer. 28 chapters, 26 lessons, Um, and so we're going to move pretty quickly. There's good and bad to that. There's upside and downside. One of the the upside to me is that when you go through something quickly, I think it's maybe easier, or as teachers maybe it'll force us, to show how these things are all connected, right? So if you have a chapter, uh, or two chapters like we have tonight, and you only have a short time to get through it, well then you kind of see it all in one pass in one pass, right? And you, and you see how it's connected. You see, that, okay, there's one theme going on here. And we want to look for that. It's not just that it's, it, it's interesting that it's narrative uh, teaching, narrative teaching. I hope what we'll see is that the narrative leads up to the teaching in a, in a, in a significant way. And the teaching builds off of the stories. And the teaching leads into the next section of stories so that the themes are carried on. And so uh, hopefully as we go through this rather quickly over the course of the summer, we'll be seeing connections that each story, when you read a story on its own, and your Bible is going to set it off, and there's going to be a heading before it and a heading afterwards. So you think this story has no relation to anything before it or anything after it, okay? Wipe that from your mind. And when you read a story, when you read a teaching, think, how does this connect to what has just happened? Or how does this connect to what's about to happen, right? Because Matthew is uh, is weaving these stories and teachings together in a purposeful way, among other things, to show Jesus as the continuation and the fulfillment of Israel's story. Uh, So that's our task over the next uh, three months. Um, And this is one of the reasons why I think it's crucial for you to be reading and thinking through the questions ahead of time before class, since we will be moving rather quickly. So I'm under the impression that there are still more booklets out there. 
Okay, I should have started a class by offering uh, to those that didn't have one, but uh, I, I was intent on uh, getting us kicked off. So uh, apologies for not offering those booklets at the beginning of class, but I believe there are still booklets back there, and we're going to be making more, I'm sure. So at least by Sunday, we can have more booklets, and the material is on the website, uh, media Bible class material, and the questions that we have so far are there for you to, uh, to access. Okay. Final thoughts? There you go. Um, what do we say? Five-minute break or three-minute break? Okay, this, this, tonight's about, you know, proving that we can do Wednesday night, you know, quickly. So, you know.